The larger a problem is, the more you have to decompose it, the more you have to divide and conquer. Continuous delivery gives you the discipline and the methodology to break things up. Continuous delivery is important at Facebook or at VMware to get high quality products. For an early stage startup, it's to figure out if you're even working on the right thing in the first place. The thing you quickly learn when you start working that way is, your intuition is wrong. It's easy to say, make shipping cheap, and it's hard to do. Keeping the cost of shipping down is definitely the key to being successful with continuous delivery. Hi, I'm Paul Berger, founder of CircleCI. I'm Edith Harba, CEO and co-founder at LaunchDarkly. And you're listening to To Be Continuous, a podcast about continuous delivery and software development. You can get in touch with us anytime at our Twitter handle, at ContinuousCast. The show is brought to you by HeavyBit. To learn more, visit heavybit.com. And while you're there, check out their library, home to great educational talks from other developer company founders and industry leaders. Paul couldn't make it today, but we had a very special guest, Jocelyn Goldfein, who talked to me about continuous delivery and her experiences at Facebook and VMware. So what do you like best about continuous delivery? I think it would have to be sort of the immediate gratification of immediate feedback. I think the worst thing is in the world is when you go away and you have this labor of love and you work on it for months and months and months and then you finally submit yourself to other people's eyes and you realize you got it all wrong. So I know you have a ton of experience, so now would be a great time for you to introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about you. Sure. I'm Jocelyn Goldfein, and uh, as of today, I'm an angel investor, but I spent most of my career as a software engineer and a leader of software engineering teams. I uh, did my own startup, and then I was fortunate enough to join VMware when it was pretty early, a couple hundred people, and I was one of the first engineering managers at VMware. Grew with that company through the early 2000s as we doubled every year for five years in a row. Stayed with VMware through 2010 and then uh, made the big jump from enterprise to consumer and joined Facebook. And I was at Facebook from 2010 to 2014. As an engineering director, I ran products like Newsfeed and Photos that probably a lot of your listeners have uh, have experienced. Yeah, I mean, um, I, I think your story is so fascinating. And comma, besides all that, uh, Jocelyn is also a trustee of Harvey Mudd College, uh, my alma mater. So thank you. Woohoo, go Mudd! So, what do you think is the difference between consumer and enterprise companies, and how does continuous delivery play into both of them? You know, they're really different. It, you know, VMware and Facebook, aside from both being extremely successful in their respective domains, could not be more different than two software companies can be. And I think a huge part of that is because of the kind of business that they're in. When you're making enterprise software, it's all about delivering a specific kind of value up to a maybe not one single customer. You want to serve many customers with the same product, but you're you're really grounded in a use case, and it's almost an, an intimate relationship with your customers. In consumer, by and large, the price points are so low that you need vast numbers of users, and so it's not the same kind of intimate relationship. But on the other hand, you're affecting people's daily lives. You're using your own product. And and you just sort of think really differently when you're trying to solve problems in mass than than maybe when it's sort of handcrafted per person. Yeah, I, so I came from a consumer company before this. I was at Tripit where we had 10 million users. <laughs> and one of the nice things about doing more of a, a B2D, a, a developer com- tool company now, is that I do have that intimacy. I was a little bit late for the podcast today because I was actually visiting a customer, which was a luxury you don't really have. When you have millions, yeah, no, you don't. You don't get that with millions. What are some some engineering differences, or do you think they're basically the same sort of engineering style, or are there any differences? Well, the engineering style at, at VMware and Facebook were very different. Some of that is enterprise versus consumer. Some of that is also that VMware was essentially building operating systems, and and Facebook, although it has an immensely complex infrastructure, is is still a web app and a mobile app. But certainly, one thing that really mattered to, mattered to VMware was predictability. We wanted releases to ship on time and when we expected them to ship and with everything that we had promised customers in the release. And so we were probably willing to sacrifice other, you know, we were willing to sacrifice some amount of efficiency or overhead just in the name of, of achieving that predictability because it really mattered to our customers and we, we wanted to keep those, those promises. In Facebook, you know, Facebook doesn't make any promises to its users about features arriving on any certain schedule. Things ship when they're ready. If anything, you know, users of Facebook probably wish that it would not change, <laughs> <laughs> that it would stay the same. And and that's that's one thing Facebook can't commit. And so Facebook, there's 
almost zero em- emphasis on deadlines because there's a release vehicle every day. Actually, there's there's um, there's usually two release vehicles a day for the website, and even the mobile apps um, ship twice a month, which is pretty fast for a mobile app, but pretty slow for Facebook. And so it's much more of a you don't think of it as a single product that's going to launch and be handed over to some customer to deploy. You're just sort of constantly iterating and adding features and adding features as you go. Yeah, I mean, that, that must be really hard then. How do you enforce discipline in, in getting a release out if you have this infinite amount of money and infinite amount of time? <laughs> well, I, we never actually felt like we had infinite money and infinite time, to be clear. I would say it was really ingrained in the culture and DNA of Facebook to move fast. And this was one of the reasons why. I mean, I arrived at Facebook in 2010 when it was already half a billion users. And I remember sitting in new employee orientation and Chris Cox, the head of product, got up in front of us all and said, you know, the core value of the company is to move fast. And I said, just to be devil's advocate here, obviously that served you well, but why do you need to move fast? Like, you know, the Facebook flywheel is spun up. There is no competitor who's going to overtake you if you slow down a bit. You know, why is speed so essential? And, you know, the answer is because you don't have deadlines. And so you just, the the sort of urge to go fast without without a deadline to give you discipline, the, the need for speed does give you discipline. Because what happens is, if you're fast, then you make small changes and you iterate quickly and you get feedback. And that feedback gives you the discipline to make good decisions, to decide what to do and what not to do. And that makes for better products. Yeah, just the the constant drip of information, right? Like you constantly know if the changes you're making are headed in the right direction. The hard hard truth about any A-B test is that, um, you know, there's always a B. Yeah, I mean, you've got to, if if you actually want to do right by users, you actually need to try both things and do the one that's better, right? Like you can't do right by users by making something up you, your heart may be in the right place, you can be wrong. And like, as someone who's executed thousands of A-B tests, like the thing you quickly learn when you start working that way is your intuition is wrong more than it's right. <laughs> why, why, why do you think that is? I don't know. I think humans have a tendency to over... Uh, humans are buggy in a lot of ways, okay? <laughs> so first of all, we think that we are the user. So we think if something's true for me, it's true for other people, but maybe we're actually in the minority. But we also are just not very self perceptive. Most people think they would like their newsfeed in chronological order. They believe they spend more time, they believe that gives them more comfort, they believe they see more stories that way. Well, the actual data is you don't. I mean, it's not just that like, oh, a tiny percentage of users do and maybe you're one of them and everybody else. Mm -mm. The lion's share of your likes and your clicks and your comments go to the first 10 articles in your feed. And in fact, the lion's share of those, it's a power law, go to the first article. (laughs) All right. And so if the first article, if those top 10 slots and especially the number one slot are burned on kind of uninteresting stories, which a chronological order is basically a random priority order, like you've just destroyed a ton of value for the network. Like for you, because you're seeing less good stories, but also for all your friends who are posting stories and their stories aren't getting seen by you and not getting interacted with by you. So like we think that, you know, we read everything or we give equal attention to everything, but we're not. We're buggy. We're biased to look at the top thing. Um, and we ran these tests over and over and over again because <laughs> user feedback was so clear and user behavior was so clearly the opposite. Oh yeah. I've I've been there with running the same test at, at- at TripIt, we always like people always have this idea that people want to watch a video when they come to your homepage. Oh God, I never people want to see a video. Do not. And so what would happen is like we would make these snappy videos, and people would want to retest it. And I ran the retest every time, so like nobody believes me when I say mm-hmm. our conversion will be worse with a video. It doesn't matter what the video is, mm-hmm. and like it was just this 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 truth of like. It's funny because there are moments when video is great. It's amazingly powerful. The autoplay video feature on. Facebook, on Twitter, on Tumblr, like inline video playing is huge, but it has to be the right product, right? And sort of if I'm trying to accomplish a task, which is to book a flight, and your video is delaying and interfering with my task, like I can imagine that fails. But the thing is, like you'll you'll never reason this out from first principles. Like you you can't sort of reason whether the addictiveness of video sort of weighs more heavily than the like it's interfering with my task. And you know that's why we've got to test it. That's you just you can't trust your opinion. It's just opinion, and you 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 can only you should only if you if you want to do justice to your users to your product, you should only deliver something when it's proven to be right. 
Well, so so that's interesting. So you, um, I know you're an angel investor and you advise uh, consumer and enterprise. Mm-hmm. Uh, enterprise companies, as a rule, I'd say, do not have enough volume to really do A/B tests. So mm-hmm. what's 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 your advice there? Yeah, I think that's really true. But what they do have is they they may have like small data on one dimension, which is they don't have a large number of users, they have a small number of users. But on another dimension, they can go incredibly deep with them, right? You've just come back from a customer visit. A consumer company like can't go on site. Well, you could run a user test with a one-way mirror, but you know your enterprise customers, you can just go interview all of them. <laughs> and so you may not get volume of data, but you will get sort of depth and insight of data. And yeah, for some time, I, I mean, you, you can't A-B test your way to good design, yeah. right? You have to start with a hypothesis. You have to start with a belief and try it. But feedback, it doesn't have to be, like it's an enormous luxury to have a huge volume of data. You know, Facebook could run an A-B test and in two hours have enough data points to just have like a really clear answer. And that's, that's such a great luxury. But, but feedback is immensely valuable, even if you don't have like a bright line, yes, no answer, Right. Going and showing a new feature, going and showing mocks, going and like just shadowing somebody using your product, those are immensely telling. And I think like continuous delivery doesn't have to be A-B testing. It's just also the discipline of constantly shipping what you've got and absorbing feedback on it as it stands. And what that forces you to do is always design things that work end to end. Yeah. And so you never go too far down the wrong path. You never implement the full surface area of one layer and then the full surface area of the next layer and the full surface area of the third layer before you ship it all, right? Like you do, you know, one API starts end to end and you get feedback on that and and what you learn informs the next API that you build. And that to me is the most important thing about continuous delivery is sort of that discipline of building piecewise. And I think not only does that help you deliver higher quality software once you are a VMware or a Facebook that's, you know, going strong, but if you're an early stage startup, your job is not really to deliver product. What? Wait, wait a second. No, 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 no. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know, you, you think it is and you act like it is and, and you believe it is, but an early stage startup is not a machine for delivering product the way a large software company is. You are a machine for product discovery. You are a machine for discovering product market fit. And so it is not to take a product and perfect it. It is to take a product concept and figure out if there's proof that this is a good product. And if not, to try another one. And if not, to try another one. And so continuous delivery is important at Facebook or at VMware to get high quality products. For an early state startup, it's to figure out if you're even working on the right thing in the first place. And at smaller scale, that is the loop that informs whether you're building high quality software later on. So, so this kind of fits back into lean principles then that continuous delivery is just the idea of more cycles and more, more iteration? I think that's true, but I think it's got to be a spiral, not a hamster wheel. You've got to learn something new and change something with each iteration, not just go in circles. Well, that's, yeah, I mean, um, it's a little depressing for me right now because um, some of my friends' startups are going out of business and it makes me sad. Yeah, that's really hard. You know, I don't know how you could get a hundred percent success rate. I don't know how you could get innovation without risk taking. And and guess what? The reason it's a risk is because there's failure. If we knew in advance that it was going to be successful, it would be an obvious thing to do, and then everyone would do it. Yeah. And then it wouldn't be innovation. <laughs> I, I still believe, you know, maybe it's like the great cycle of life. It might be the end of the startup, but it's not the end of the entrepreneur. Yeah, is not the end of the founder, and sort of even that is a feedback loop. It's maybe the ultimate piece of feedback that hopefully you can take and apply into the next iteration. Yeah, we we have a mutual friend, Sean Burns. Um, mm-hmm. He's an advisor, and I he start, he started a new startup. And I was like, why did you do that? And he's like, I like doing startups. Yes, totally. There's also absolutely the serial entrepreneur. I mean, it's not like his last startup failed. It's going really strong. So there is something to just like, there is a stage of existence that I thrive in and I seek it over and over. Yeah. So do you think there's any stage of startup that's too small to adopt continuous delivery or a right point to do it? You know, sometimes you're so small, you just don't have any customers. You don't have anybody to show it to, maybe your roommate or your friends. But I think you are not too small. I think even when you are a single person alone at a laptop, it is the right thing to do to sort of wire things up to work end to end. 
and to try to get one piece working at a time full stack and then broaden your footprint from there. Because even if the only feedback loop is yourself and your compiler, you will still architect better, you will still learn. Like it's still a feedback loop. Like, did this work? Did I get the functionality I expected? How does it feel to me? And, you know, is that continuous delivery within the meaning of the act? I don't know. I think it's in the spirit. Yeah. I think we've all gone on that yak shaving expedition <laughs> where we had some amazing concept in mind and we wrote a ton of code and then, you know, we got to the next layer and it didn't work out the way we expected and we threw a lot away. Yak shaving. I've not heard that one before. Oh, you know, the, uh, I don't know the sort of, I don't actually know the story behind it, but it's just sort of like you can always, you know, whenever you're working on solving a problem, it's sort of like, oh, but I could build a generic problem solver to solve my problem. And it's sort of like the increasing spiral of abstraction we can oh. get into. <laughs> of like, let me build a tool to solve the problem, to solve the problem, to solve the problem that I'm trying to solve. And, you know, sometimes you do get a ton of leverage from solving something at a lower layer of abstraction or a higher layer of abstraction, but sometimes you just end up shaving the yak <laughs> in order to make the sweater. <laughs> That's a great image. Do you, do, you ever, do you think there's any enterprise or organization too big to do continuous delivery? No. Nope. <laughs> Full stop. I mean, I've, the largest company I've ever worked for was VMware was a little over 10,000 people when I left. But in, in my past life, you know, I worked for an enterprise company that sold software to really enormous enterprises, you know, compact, General Motors. I, there is no size, and, and I think we all know this as computer scientists, right? Like there is no problem so large, like the larger a problem is, the more you have to decompose it, the more you have to divide and conquer. And so you've got to break things up and continuous delivery gives you the discipline and the methodology to break things up. Yeah. I agree, but I'm I'm pretty biased. <laughs> <laughs> sure. So the 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 people I think who would say, oh, continuous delivery cannot work for me, I don't think it's so much a function of size, but they might say, like VMware would tell you, we can't ship our software every week. We certainly can't ship it twice a day because our customers can't deploy it that fast, right? It's an operating system, it runs in their data centers. You know, it's on prem, and if I give them, you know, if I give them a CD, it takes them, you know, a, a, a two months to test it before they, you know, gradually roll it out. You know, I certainly can't give them a new CD every day because their, their test cycle, my customer's adoption cycle alone, is longer than that. That, that, that would be like the AOL of CDs. Yeah. <laughs> I do actually somewhere in a shoebox still have some little gold colored <laughs> um, CDs that were the gold master version of various VMware releases I worked on. But I think even in a situation like that where your, your customers cannot adopt very quickly, it's still valuable to do continuous delivery, first, internally. Second, you know, an immense sort of unsung hero of, you know, VMware is known for the quality of its software, right? When you think about deploying data center operating systems, the only thing that made, and, and, and in VMware's early days, I mean, right now we all sort of take it for granted. It's actually so old, it's become legacy technology. We're all moving on to containers, right? But um, you take for granted that a VM works. Like, you, you'd never question, oh, right? Well, like, uh, we just deploy in the cloud. Of course, there's virtualization behind it. I um, who would were... deploy on bare metal hardware? My God. I remember when VMware was new. Yes, it was science fiction. It was like, oh, uh, you know, I might run a test in that VM, but I could never entrust a production environment to like some yeah. kooky, you know, virtual machine instead of a real machine. And so, you know, we had no business. Like, we were out of business if we could not convince enterprises that this was rock solid, that yeah. it had no bucks. And so, quality, you know, not just Deadline predictability, release predictability, but quality was incredibly important at VMware. And one of the ways we achieved that was an incredibly robust beta program where we absolutely had users who were constantly trying new and unreleased versions of the software and giving us feedback. And actually, VMware has these sort of boutique products, which are sort of hard to understand in the context of their revenue. It's like, why do you have so many engineers working on something that is you know, 1% of, of your revenue, things like Workstation or Fusion or VMware Player. And the answer is, well, Workstation is a developer tool, and yeah, it doesn't make a ton of money, but actually developers and QA engineers who are the users of this software are the ideal people to have in your beta program. They will shake it down, they will find every bug, they will tear it apart, they will spend their Christmas vacation trying <laughs> it on every kind of hardware and every operating system because they geek out on it. And lo and behold, you find all these bugs in your Workstation beta program that harden the platform before it goes into the data center production. And so... You know, even in a world where the data center cannot 
take a release every day. You can have a form of your stack that gets in front in a free or an open source manner, certainly in a beta program. The beta program um, you know, was not something Facebook had in its DNA because we always just shipped things yeah. into production on web and we would just control, you know, rollout with feature gating and beta and and not beta tests, but like actual just in production live tests. Well, when it comes to mobile, that's more tricky. You don't get to ship every day. And uh, you don't get instant, like two weeks is actually not continuous, right? <laughs> Especially as far as Facebook was concerned. And so Facebook actually runs a really robust beta program for its Android and iOS mobile apps. And those have been huge for Facebook. So I think one of the things that's really great about beta too is like there's implicit consent. There's a contract between you and the user that you're trying something out on them. And not only do they like, Agree to do that, like in some ways, like you would think that this set of users that you're giving this crappy, buggy, unfinished version of your product would have less satisfaction. Invariably, people in your beta program have higher satisfaction with you because when they see it in the unfinished state, they feel like they get to participate. They feel like they have input and they're helping you build it. And it's like, it's that craving of ownership, of identity that people want. Yeah, I mean, it's, um, they, they feel like they're a co producer of it. That's right. And when people are when your software really creates value for people, when it really is meaningful in their lives, I think a lot of people want to feel that ownership. They want to feel that co-production credit, right? Like we'd all love to sort of see our name in the credits. And I think that that feeling inspires incredible trust and loyalty, even though like superficially it might seem like just the opposite, like you're taking advantage of them. So I, I think is this sort of incredible win-win actually. Yeah, um so Paul, Paul's not here today, but um, Paul's company, Circle CI. One of the happiest things I saw is one of their engineers used her product, mm-hmm. and they made an Instagram of um, him using the product and then doing a little happy dance. Because mm-hmm. he's and I found out later the reason why he did it is he was trying to show his parents what it was like to release software. <laughs> That's cool. So he's this kid, you know, from Ireland, and he wanted to show his parents how it feels like when you release something. Yeah, yeah, that sense of like. Victory, I think of, of you know, it, there was there was void, and then you typed, and then there was form. You know, it's the act of creation. Yeah, I mean, I think I think that's, I mean, that's why I became an engineer. Is I love just feeling like I was creating something. Yeah, and I think especially too, you know, you never just sort of type and have it work, right? There's always that period of, you know, debugging and why isn't it doing what I expected, and I have to track this down and solve it, and it feels like sort of just. Sometimes just like doing battle, and will I succeed or will I fail? Right, like that that feeling of jeopardy that you get, <laughs> and um, and then when you sort of come out the other side, you do feel victorious. You know, <laughs> <laughs> when you're describing, I was picturing um, the scenes of the original Star Wars where they're tinkering on the Millennium Falcon. Mm-hmm. They're like, "Is it gonna go? Is it gonna go?" And then just the right minute, it goes into hyperdrive. Yes, yes, exactly. So That's the feeling. I guess continuous delivery is like hopefully you know the whole success or failure of your enterprise does not depend on getting the hyperdrive online one shot. Like <laughs> hopefully you get you may, hopefully you have many small engines and you get lots of them working one by one. Yeah, well, that's a good point about continuous delivery. Doesn't always mean just pushing everything to everybody. It might just mean having a process to get it to the right people at the right time. Yeah, I mean, I think as long as you don't let your code base ever sit in a state where it doesn't work. So this is fascinating. So we had a conversation at, at um, supper a couple months ago about why there's still so much legacy code out there. <laughs> code lives a long time. Yeah, I mean, um, you know, there's still like a lot of Fortran floating around. Yep. This is uh, what was it, in uh, Y2K. They had to dig up all these people who knew COBOL because when all that code was written in the 70s, nobody. Thought ever dreamed it would still be running and thirty years later and need to be modified and you know they couldn't find people with the current skills <laughs> to modify it. Well, I think that's one of the drawbacks of of not using continuous delivery is that if if you build it once and mm-hmm. then walk away, that your code kind of becomes an evolutionary. Yes. Well, the nature of code is that everything connects, and so it's not like building a chair or even a piece of art where you finish it and it's done and it. Exists in the world, and you know, maybe I don't know. I guess art, great paintings do sort of decay over thousands of years with light and photography and museum quality glass and restoration. But, but in general, like you, you put something out there and it's static and it has a lifetime, and at the end of its life, it's thrown away. And software is almost more like a living organism. It almost needs to sort of constantly be fed. It constantly needs new nutrients. It constantly needs clean up. It constantly needs to evolve. 
And I think that's because it's in constant interaction with the, with its environment, not just with the ways that people use it, but with the system or the stack that it sits on top of. And so, you know, I think it's tremendously frustrating. Actually, it can be. You know, I've certainly worked with customers to whom it is frustrating that they can't just sort of buy a piece of software and have it be done and never think about it again, the way they can with you know another piece of equipment. But I, I think that's just the nature of the of the animal. Do, do, do you think that will ever be? I'll just be provocative. Do you think software will ever be done? No, no. That's well. That's an easy knee jerk reaction. Could it be so self contained? Well, that's the appliance vision, right? Is that we can put some software on a piece of hardware and like just treat it as though it's hardware that it's a black box. I think you know it comes down to what I said before that sort of everything connects. And as much as we want to do a great job of API design and not having side effects and treat software like modular building blocks. And you know, I do think in the microservices age, this is more true. We've delivered more on that vision than ever before. I still think that you can never anticipate all the ways that your code will be used and called upon up and down the line. So I think, you know, you could certainly imagine a piece of software running on a cable modem that sort of you know, at the end of its life, you throw the cable modem away. You don't update it. You just get a new cable modem with the new software. But it's, you know, outside of like firmware embedded appliances like that that have really contained inputs and outputs, it's hard to imagine software that doesn't need to constantly evolve. That that that, that doesn't get used in ways you could never anticipate when you wrote it the first time. Yeah, the only one I can really come up with is gas stations. Hmm. Okay, but even gas stations are going to really change, right? Like gas stations 20 years from now are definitely not going to look like they are today. But it, it, to your point, we probably write completely new software to deal with, you know, battery charging then and not try to sort of reuse, you know, the what's running the meter at the at the pump. You know, not to sort of have a hammer and look at every problem as a nail, but I think like this this kind of goes to the the theme of continuous delivery again and sort of constant feedback, which is you know, I would say the early days of software were sort of dominated by this idea of we have to anticipate everything that's yeah. ever going to be needed of our code. And this is what led to sort of the 700 page volumes of specs and, you know, specifications of like under every possible condition, what do you want it to do? And, you know, I really think that what we've learned in the decades since is that you cannot anticipate. And so rather than trying to get better and better at anticipate, I mean, you should do some anticipation, but you, you shouldn't just sort of throw darts. But, you know, there's really diminishing marginal returns, and you should try to anticipate as well as you can, but try it and find out. <laughs> Works far better than sort of sitting in an ivory tower trying to think of everything. Well, Jocelyn, um, I, I, I love geeking out about continuous delivery, as, just, as you can tell. <laughs> Do you see any drawbacks to continuous delivery, or have you seen it misapplied? Well, churn, right? Like the, you know, the allure of let me just build it once as opposed to let me build it over and over and over again is like, oh, do I, is there a lot of overhead, right? And constantly, because there is an overhead to shipping, right? Like releasing in and of itself has a cost. And so if I release every day, that's in theory paying a higher price than releasing once a month. I think like the cost of the mistakes you accumulate over the course of a month without feedback are much greater than the cost of releasing. But, but I think that, um, let me say, like, if you try to do continuous delivery and you have a release process that's designed for predictability or quality or something else other than release frequency, then the cost of release can be very, very high indeed, right? Like, if it takes you more than a day to ship, then shipping every day is just not possible, right? Or is pointless. So, I would say that in order to be successful at continuous delivery, you have to make the cost of shipping cheap. Yeah. And that's hard. Uh, and you have to trade off other things to make that possible. <laughs> you know, I'm trying hard to think of an example where that's the wrong trade off. You know, I guess just a world where, I don't know, rocket launch systems, you don't need to ship very often. And like you're trying to change something, you're trying to change as little as possible. And there's something else that's more important. But I just think that the, even if you're trying to change it as little as possible, you also can't tolerate any risk in the rocket launch, right? And so more, Test feedback, more beta feedback, more like even though you don't actually launch the rocket very many times, you you definitely want feedback all the time to to make that high quality. So, is there a world where you don't want things to change very often, but quality is not the prime mover? And I'm having trouble coming up <laughs> with an example off the cuff, but I think keeping the cost of shipping down is definitely the sort of the key to being successful with continuous delivery. And I think that's sort of 
I don't want to say it's easily overlooked, but it's easy to say make shipping cheap, and it's hard to do, especially if you started out, if you came from a world where you didn't start out with continuous delivery in mind, you know, you started out with infrequent releases, and you sort of evolved into this very expensive, very heavyweight release process. Maybe you have three weeks of acceptance testing, you know, whatever, whatever it may be, figuring out how to dial back from that into something that can be more lightweight, that's just hard. It's hard. Do you think it's because of people don't have the tools or it's a mental process shift? Well, it's a risk, right? You have to, if you have a three week acceptance test process, like your first thought is, well, how do I cram all of that testing into three hours? And, you know, maybe that's possible with automation. Maybe it's not. And so then you actually just have to decide, I'm going to live without that. Or I'm going to live with finding some class of bugs after I ship instead of, after I release, quote unquote, rather than before. Um, hopefully not after you ship to customers, but <laughs> after some kind of internal release. And I, I think that's scary. I think that kind of risk can be scary, especially if you have a lot to lose. If you've had a lot of success, if you have a lot of customers relying on you, you know, you you need a powerful motivation to change from a status quo that's pretty good. That's so correct. I can't. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, yeah, I'm, I'm talking platitudes now. No, I'm just, I'm just speechless. <laughs> well, Jocelyn, I really enjoyed you coming by today. Do you have any any final thoughts you'd like to share? I guess the the one is, you know, as much as I'm a booster for continuous delivery, I don't think there's any such thing as a release process that's one size fits all, that like everybody should do things exactly the same way. So if I had sort of one, you know, drum to beat, it would be, you know, there is no one true way. There, there is no ideology that applies equally to every software. You know, VMware and Facebook were such different companies. They made software such different ways, but they operated in such different environments that with, with, with such different goals. And so I think that, you know, the best, thing anybody can do when making software is to sort of sit down and figure out what really matters to you. You know, are you trying to discover whether you have a viable product? Are you trying to keep customers happy? Are you trying to acquire new customers? Are you trying to get people more engaged with your product? Are you trying to, you know, get a lot of bang from a very lean engineering team? Um, you know, is 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 it life and death quality? You know, like, like, figure out. Start from what you value, and back into, and and what your constraints are, and and sort of back into the right process from that, because it will be different. It will depend on what you're optimizing for. Yeah, that's that's a really good way to frame it. Um, you know, is it time, satisfaction, predictability? Yeah, I mean, you know, we've all been, or, or we've all encountered and I have been, you know, that that sort of crusty engineering manager who says, oh, you know, schedule. Features or quality, pick two out of three. Yeah, that's me, right? <laughs> and it's because we live that because those things are in a trade-off with one another, right? Like it's a fundamental time-space trade-off, and um, and it's like, gosh, why can't you people grasp that? You can't have everything all the wait, time. Wait, wait, wait. why can't everybody be an engineer like me? Yes, it's the exasperation of other people not understanding the constraints you live with, right? Um, in truth, I think it's actually many more than a three-dimensional trade-off. Like I think there's also the number of engineers that you have. I think there's also performance. I think there's also like I think you know when you talk about schedule, there's like how is the schedule predictable, and then there's also is the schedule frequent, and I think those are two different things. I think you know how productive is the engineering team is yet another dimension. I think those trade offs exist. I think you can move the trade off curves with better tools, you know. And so like I think what's wrong with being that crusty engineer is like when you accept the constraints that the trade offs, then then you don't always see that there is a way to move the trade off curve. And I think we should all be open minded about finding those. And you know, and I do think that sort of modern continuous integration tools are an immense leap forward on what we had to do five years, ten years ago, um, and really have shifted some of those trade-off curves. And I think sometimes it feels like magic. Sometimes it feels like a free lunch, you know, which is what turns us all into evangelists. But at the end of the day, those trade-offs still exist, even if we can shift the curves. And so you have to, you just have to start from a place of knowing what you really care about, knowing what you value. I'd love to hear like just one or two examples about how the curve has shifted for you. The two really profound changes in the trade-off curve have occurred in my professional lifetime. One was the move from desktop software to web, which was transformative, right? Running, deploying your code on your own servers that you control versus you know sending it on a CD to somebody else to put to install for themselves, you know, was. Absolutely game changing yep. in terms of the cost of a release, right? 
again, not because you had a three-week acceptance test process, but just because customers were not going to take a new CD from you every day, right? <laughs> <laughs> and so the ability to change our code as often as we wanted, the ability to know in real time what people were doing with our code, like that was... Um, Transformational. And, you know, there were years and years of desktop software people saying, oh, well, the web is fine for, you know, sites where you look things up or for search, but, you know, it will never replace rich, interactive, engaging software features like I have on desktop. And then, you know, Google Maps shipped with the first version of Ajax, and all of a sudden it was like, whoa, this is kind of game over for desktop. And now, like, you know, nobody setting out to build software today would dream of building, you know, a native client app before they built the web version. You might eventually, you know, if you're Slack, you eventually getting around to a Mac client or a Windows client, but you certainly start on web. But then the second big sea change <laughs> has taken us backwards, which is mobile. Yeah. And we have this whole new generation of software engineers who have grown up with this kind of attitude of, well, of course, native mobile apps are the right thing and web is old and legacy. And because the web cannot deliver these really rich, engaging, <laughs> interactive experiences on your phone that you want. And so far they're right. You know, the, the native app does beat the web in terms of that richness of user experience. And, and they'll be right. And it's the wrong thing to do to try to coerce your users to use mobile web instead of a native app just because you can ship code faster, because you can have better continuous delivery, because you can change things on the fly. So for now, you've got to meet people where they're at, give them the experiences they want, and ship native mobile apps. But I do believe that long-term, the advantages of deploying code on servers you control, and mobile apps are not as bad as desktop because at least the majority of the brains sit in the cloud, right? And it's really just the front end that's stuck on the user's device. And you also have a better install path with app stores than than we did on Windows, but but it's still like it's still a significant step backwards. To be clear, to run to have to send your code out into the world to run on somebody else's device versus running on a device you have access to. So I I think the curve of history will bend back the other way. That we will eventually see mobile web become successful enough, rich enough, interactive enough that the companies developing for the web will just be able to move faster and deliver more value to users. But it's a bet, and it's you know it's not the same world as it was in the '90s, not least because Apple and Google have a different kind of power yeah. over the over their platform. So we'll see. It will be fascinating to to watch this play out. I, I, I completely agree with you, and I'll even add that I think um, consumers don't actually want an app for everything. Mm-hmm. Well, that's definitely true. I, I think there there was a wave when it was just like, oh, everybody like you know Levi's jeans has to have an app. Why? Because you're not buying. Because you do buy stuff. You used to buy jeans on Levi's.com from your desktop, and you don't buy jeans from Levi's.com on your phone. And everybody said, "Oh, the solution to you know insufficient engagement, insufficient conversion on mobile web is a mobile app." But the trouble is, I'm not willing to have an app for every brand that I purchase. Yeah, you don't. You don't want to have a Levi's app and a Nike app. You want to go to a site. You want the shopping mall of yeah. apps, right? You want to be able to all buy all the all the brands in one place. This is maybe a good moment to plug one of my portfolio companies, <laughs> which is trying to solve this problem. They're called Doat, and uh, I think Doat Shopping is trying to be that sort of single mobile app that gives you a rich native shopping experience, but uh, combines all the brands that you love. So, shout out for Doat. Yeah, well, uh, well, we are almost out of time, but um, are there any other angel investments that you feel? You'd like to mention? Oh man, I, the the prop. This is like naming your children because there's, um, you know, there's more than a dozen of them, and and so I can't name just a few. I think <laughs> we'll we'll stop at one because <laughs> because that problem happened to come up as an example. Oh yeah. Well, um, thank you very much for coming by. I really enjoyed talking to you, and um, it was great to catch up with you on continuous delivery and the future and past of apps. Awesome. Thanks for having me. Thanks for listening to this episode of To Be Continuous, brought to you by Heavybit and hosted by me, Paul Bigger of CircleCI, and Edith Harbaugh of LaunchDarkly. To learn more about Heavybit, visit heavybit.com. While you're there, check out their library, home to great educational talks from other developer company founders and industry leaders. 